Sind Sie hier richtig? Drittes Semester Reaktionsmechanismen. Ah. Also begrüße ich Sie herzlich. Mein Name ist Oliver Reiser und wir werden hier die Vorlesung zusammen machen. Ich bin ja hier schier erschlagen, wie viele das sind. Gibt es hier irgendjemanden im Raum, der kein Deutsch spricht? Anyone who does not speak German? So you know we have a, re we have a policy here in this, uh, that starting with semester three, if anyone in this room requests that the lecture is being held in English, we will do it. <coughs> so German or English? No, but that's the uh, that's but that's that's the way it is here. Hat jemand ein hat jemand ein großes Problem, wenn diese Vorlesung in Englisch stattfindet? <lacht> Warum ist das so? Is, is it you who wrote to me a couple of times? Yeah. No, no, we have to be we have to be. Where, where are you from? You're from England or? Yeah. Ich möchte, lassen Sie mich das kurz einfach sagen, ich möchte wetten, dass, wenn ich von Ihnen einen Lebenslauf anfordern würde, dass zwei Drittel von Ihnen in Ihrem Lebenslauf würde schon stehen, fließend in Englisch in Wort und Schrift. <lacht> biggest lie, biggest lie in any CV from Germans, right? Because this is a long way to get there and even I would be hesitant to write this into my, into my CV. But the other thing is you need English. Besides that you want to become a good chemist here, the one thing you need is English. You will probably never publish a paper in German. You will probably, when you go to a, a company, they will request that you have to do English. You have to be very good in English, fluent in English. Let me give you one interesting example. I was at a Swiss company recently. We were four people in the room, all were Germans. We were making some small talk, having coffee. Uh, of course, we were speaking German. We were starting to discuss the project, and suddenly my host said, we have to switch to English. Although we were all Germans in the room, there was nobody else. And they said, I said, why is this? They said, the reason for this is that we have to write a protocol Anyone in the company has to be able to access what was being done in this meeting. So we have to write the protocol in English and we have the policy that everything is being done in English. And so this is a skill you have to acquire. There is nothing uh, against it. So and in this, in, for this reason, since we have at least, and we are, we, are, we are following this policy here now, that if we have uh, uh, students from abroad here who do not speak German, we will have these language, the, we will have it in English. Now, we are going to tape this lecture. You can see Helena back there is on the camera, we are taping it. So you will be able, and we are putting it on the net, you will be able, everything you do not follow right now, you will be able to review. So this is the one thing. There's a tutorial of this, there's a tutorial of the class, the tutorial is in German, okay, so that's also given. The, the, sorry? No, the exam, the exam is, but well, mostly you will, mostly you will draw structures. If it makes you happy that I, if you have a, a question, typical question of this exam is provide a mechanism for this and this reaction. If I then I should write the German question below this, bitte geben Sie einen Reaktionsmechanismus für die, für die folgenden Transformation an, I will do it. There's a plan B. This lecture is also given for the teacher students and it's almost the same. And it's given by Professor König, but I think the times are a little bit different. This lecture is in German, and it is also being taped. So you have the alternative that you more or less can, even if you cannot physically attend, 
you can watch Professor Koenig's lecture, which follows the same outline on a little bit lower level, because after all, it's teacher and biology students, I think. <laughs> <laughs> we have to cut this out later. <laughs> I, I don't. Uh, but you have, the, you have the opportunity to have this. So with this, having said this, I would propose here that indeed this lecture will be given in English. And trust me on this. This is the one thing. You have still a number of years during your studies here to improve on this. But this is the one skill besides chemistry you have to master. There's no way around this. And you start better start early. You know that we are offering a English for Chemists class you can take from our foreign language department. It's here in the department. Go to their website. I think that we are offering two classes. It's, I think one is Wednesday uh, early evening, one is Thursday even early evening. It's English for Chemists. You can go there. You can get a certificate. In the sixth semester, there will be also the, the, uh, the class Advanced Organic Synthesis will be also in English you will acquire for this also a language certificate. So we realize that you have to suffer a little bit more if you go through our English classes here. But on the other hand, we will give you something for this. You will get an official UNICERT certificate after, uh, according to the EU regulations. And it's a valid language certificate you can use later for applications. And, and it's required on, on, in many instances. So you're getting something out of this. I didn't see too many hands coming up, shooting up when we said we, we are going to have it in English. And the ones who struggle a little bit with this, uh, please either take one of the other options I, I, I told you. Again, you can, can watch on video Professor Koenig's lecture. Um, and I'm sure that the hands which were going up were probably not meant as, as badly as, uh, as it might seem. OK. so. With having said this, then we should talk about some chemistry. And the rea the, this lecture is a lecture on reaction mechanisms. And the question is, what should this bring you? You will see many reactions again, which you have learned about already last semester in the beginner's lecture of organic chemistry. This lecture was more that you would see different classes of compounds, and then you would go through this. Uh, you would learn about the properties of these compounds. But in the end, uh, and you would learn about the reactions. But in the end, you saw some reaction mechanisms, but you did not really, the, the lecture was not focusing so much on the mechanisms. This one will much more focus on mechanism. And uh, what you should be able, in the end, to learn or to become more familiar with this is that in the organic chemistry, in organic chemistry, we always praise ourselves that this is a subdiscipline of chemistry which is extremely logic, where you should, in principle, be able if you see two components and you're being asked how should they react with each other, that you can make an educated guess how that should proceed simply because there are rules. And a lot of these rules are manifested in mechanisms, in concepts. And that is something I will try to, to uh, uh, have taken part in this lecture, that we are going to learn about this and focusing always on concept. Although you will see many reactions you have already seen before. You might have even seen the mechanisms before. You will see also some new reactions on this. And so this should be. I want to oh, wait a minute. I want some, some additional lights, but I think this is all we are getting here. And so this is the idea of this lecture. The idea should be that in the end, of course, it's always good if you see a reaction you know already, and then you can write very quickly how a mechanism works. But in the end, you should start to be able <coughs> to simply use the concepts you know. And you will see there are not too many of these concepts that you will be able to simply work with this. And even if you don't know it, that don't know the answer right away, that you can work out, work through a problem. And that if we can accomplish this a little bit, and I say this, I, I give this speech in this lecture, I give the same speech you will hear it one year later if you go in the sixth semester lecture, because 
it's still not mastered and of course there are coming more reactions, uh, catalysts then in addition and everything so things will become more complicated, there's no doubt about this but the underlying principles are always the same and uh, can, be, uh, can be worked out uh, very well. I had a, a, an oral test years ago in my studies and in the end the professor told me and said you really don't know too much but with the little you know you work quite well and this is <laughs> this is something we need to accomplish here. Okay, so having said this we are going to discuss mechanisms and there are a few things I would like to in the, in the beginning to also encourage you to follow uh, in, in order that you are able to, to master uh, this class. And the one thing is, since we are going to draw a lot of structures, you need to be able to, that's very simple to say, you need to be able to, to, be able to draw formulas in a clear, in a, in a good way. And I can Sometimes in some of these lectures I will bring, I have to copy some of the, I have bachelor exams in the moment, one after the other. And I will, I will copy, I will scan some in and I will show you. And you will see immediately that it is so differ, different between the students that some draw very nice structures, very clear structures, and some it's just like my three-year-old nephew drawing on a piece of paper something. And the reason why this is so important is that if you make clear drawings, you avoid mistakes. If you do not make clear drawings, atoms get lost, charges get lost, and, 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 and basically it's, it's open for, much more open for mistakes. And so the one thing I would like to encourage you is to sometimes just sit down in the cafeteria or whatever and see if you can draw some nice formulas. It, goes, it starts very often with little things like rings, right? Can I draw a good four-membered ring? Can I draw a nice five-membered ring? Can I draw a nice six-membered ring, right? This way it's still okay. Then if you go to the larger rings, uh, it starts already getting very often a little bit more complicated. Can I get a nice seven-membered ring, eight-membered ring, and so on. You don't need seven and eight-membered rings so often. But just things like this. And then also uh, clear drawings where you can see like the number of uh, electrons. So one thing, I'm not sure how your, how your, um, how your uh, basic lecture was, but I, I'm very much in favor in drawing always all the electrons uh, in a molecule as localized bonds. I try to avoid things like this because then at some point if you do something like this and you have something like saying an aromatic structure, you start wondering how many electrons are in this three-membered ring here if it's such a cyclopropyl cation here and you wonder is it is it now two electrons? Or, so here you might know because you see this often it's six, but here you might have a much harder time to recognize that this is two, right? So, so, so little rules like this and it will help you to, to simply, and, and we, we try to do this and I, I will try my best here to, uh, to also follow this what I'm saying here. Let me tell you it's much harder to do this on a big board than to do this on your, on your piece of paper, um, but we, we are going to we are, we are, I, I, will, I will do my best here to, uh, to make this. And I see already this five-membered ring was not particularly nice here. So, yeah. But you will see that this helps you also in tests and so on. It will help you to make, to avoid really trivial mistakes where you say, I, I knew everything like this and then I tried to work out the problem and I, I got off. And the other thing we will see a lot is uh, that if we draw mechanisms that there is a very simple concept to follow. Very often you have, like it is in real life, you have some, someone who gives, you have someone who takes, and so we will see a lot the principle 
that some part of a molecule can act as a donor, another molecule can act as an acceptor. And we will see uh, bond formations of this kind. And so the, sometimes you might have a middleman in here where you also have then maybe something like this going on. But in principle, this donor acceptor concept is very often is very often used. And what you see here is that electrons in general flow in one direction. And so if you draw mechanisms, you will with one big ex ex exemption, and that is something we are going to have in the first chapter here of this lecture, radicals. But very often, or almost always, if you draw reaction mechanisms, the arrows will never go against each other. They will always go into one direction. And then also, of course, the other thing between donors and acceptors is that if you have reactions where electrons will go in, in, in a cyclic manner, where basically you don't have a clear donor and you don't have a clear acceptor, but by rearranging that every, everyone gives, every, every part of the mo every molecule is acting as a donor and as an acceptor at the same time, you are also usually having sensible mechanisms. And we will, especially these type of reactions, we will cover in great, in more, much more greater detail than you had in the beginning lecture to have such reactions where electrons move in a cyclic way. And we will learn that although a lot of them look good on paper, that for example, if you have a thermal reaction, we will have then to learn the concepts that this is really OK. But this is really not. And we have to understand then why this is. And then there are more concepts. But at least from the electron flow, and the reaction mechanisms is a lot about electron flow. From the electron flow, this looks OK. It would not be OK somehow if you would start uh, moving like here. And you go to here, and then you would go with the, from the same atom back to the, to the carbon to work the arrows against it. So this is something we will, uh, we will have to, to analyze in, in, in much more detail. But a lot of the mechanisms we are going to see follow these two principles, donor acceptor or a type of a cyclic electron movement. However, the first chapter of this lecture, where we will begin with is radicals. And radicals work a little bit different. What is a radical? Typically, radicals are formed by some kind of a homolytic bond scission. And then radicals define themselves by having a, by being single electron species. Now here I only depicted how the bond is breaking. If I should now also show this as arrows, and now you see here, if I would draw this, I indeed would now move arrows 
against each other in difference to here. You see here the arrows where we had these two electron processes, they were flowing in one direction. Here really the arrows go against each other. And we are depicting, uh, if we talk about radicals, homolytic, one electron movements, we are, tr we are only writing this with a half arrow rather than, so here we are using arrows which only have one part of the arrowhead. So this is for radicals, one electron movements. as opposed to the cases where we use the full arrow and this depicts two electron movements. So in principle this is a a radical and typical reactions. Let, let's look at a let's look at a example. Still, we have no idea how we accomplish this bond session yet. But to fill this with life is that if you would homolytically cleave the bond of a of methyl of a methyl halide here, you would end up with a methyl radical and a halide radical here. So let's briefly talk about then what kind of structure. Here in this case, and what we could envision is a two situation that we really have a carbon which has three binding partners, and therefore you would look at this as being sp2 hybridized. And then the remaining p orbital here is the orbital which has the single electron located in. And the alternative to this would be that you could envision also that a radical carbon could be sp3 hybridized and again in this case the lone pair would be in an sp3 orbital the, the electron the single electron would be in an, in an sp3 orbital And as a consequence, as it is known, and you might have seen something like this when you discussed a means already in the, in the basic lecture, is that 
such species have the tendency that this electron this can tunnel through the carbon atom and rapidly interconvert. And you can see that as this basically interconverts, it would run, in this case, as a transition state through a structure like this. Now, in general, molecules tend to orient their groups as far away as possible. And an electron is considered to be only a small entity. So therefore, uh, in general, it is accepted that such radicals have, uh, have an sp2 structure with the single electron being located in a p orbital. So this is the type of structure electrons are de uh, radicals are depicted from. In this situation, although it's very, it's very similar in principle in, in energy to this situation, is not being, uh, is not being the case, is not being the structure you uh, find radicals in there. It's a little bit different if you have the corresponding anions. If you would have a methyl anion here, in this case, now you have two electrons. And the two electrons basically are as space demanding as such a hydrogen is. So they become their own. Uh, they, they act basically as, as an own substituent. So here, such, such methyl anions are known to be really sp3 SP hybridized. And being in such a tetrahedral uh, arrangement, why radicals are depicted in being sp2 hybridized and being in a trigonal planar arrangement. So when, one very important concept whenever we look at organic reactions is stability. And so we should also look at stability of radicals. And the underlying concept here is that molecules simply try always to somehow uh, drive into a stable uh, into the most stable uh, arrangements, thermodynamic control. And so therefore, any type of radical, let's take again the methyl radical, uh, we have to consider what kind of factors would stabilize it and what factors uh, would not stabilize it. And so in the sense of what we said earlier, donor acceptors. Um, the question here is, would donors or acceptors on such a uh, radical atom, would this stabilize or destabilize a, a radical? And so the first question we have to answer here is, is a radical an electron deficient or a species, or has it is it an electron-rich species? Any ideas? We have now, we can, can now by hand holding. So the first ones, the moment questions being asked here, the first people leaving the room. <laughs> Who thinks a radical is electron deficient? Who thinks it's electron-rich? Who thinks it's just something I should not bother about? <laughs> Because I saw two people for electron, 
Well, what did we start with? Electron deficient, right? Electron deficient, I think two votes, one vote for electron rich, and the rest was undecided. So, so what is it? Why did you say it's electron rich? Um, because it has one unpaired electron with which it can react. It has one pair electron with which it can react. So at least, yeah. There's an, un, uh, there's an lone pair, but the question is, will it decide if it's electron rich or poor by the fact that it is very reactive? Has reactivity something to do with being electron rich or electron poor? So we will have to see that that probably is not the case. And then here the two votes over there for electron deficient. Why is this? Do we have a rule? I'm sure you're meaning the right thing. You said it has only the, the what the answer was just given is he said it has only one electron and it wants to have two. It's close, but it's the wrong numbers. Uh, it, it has only seven electrons and it wants to have eight, right? So again, one thing you have to carry around with you and always consider in organic chemistry is the octet rule. Very important. More atoms like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, halogens, chlorine here, and, and also the, the everything before here, boron, we will see a lot. They are striving to have an octet. Everything which is below an octet is electron deficient. This carbon here has seven electrons on its carbon. And this makes it unhappy. It wants to have eight. <coughs> and so therefore, I would consider every radical in the first moment as being electron deficient. And so then the question is, what should stabilize it? A donor or an acceptor? Should we have another vote to see if now some of the undecided have changed their opinion. So who thinks a donor should stabilize it? Who, who thinks an acceptor should stabilize it? So we have a few more votes. There's still 80% of this class are still undecided. Why do you think an acceptor? We had one vote for acceptor. Why do you think it's acceptor? Again, you guys starting like you you say again, it's a proton and it should react. Now careful here, you're starting to mix reactivity with the concepts of stability. So the question is, if it can react with a, let's say it can react with a proton, we have to see in this in a moment. The question is, does this tell you something what would stabilize such a, such a, uh, a, a species? And so for sure, a donor here, because it's electron deficient, any type of donor should stabilize such a radical. And we know donors uh, which would have, so let me, let me stay in this here. So we have here the radical <coughs> where there are no direct donors on there. Now let me propose a 
substituent here. And I would argue that indeed that this type of substituent is able to stabilize such a radical. And if I put this in a in a drawing like this, I would, for example, like to argue here that indeed such a alkoxy substituent is able to stabilize such a radical because it has a lone pair here. And the electron deficiency, which, it, which is given on this carbon, can be stabilized by electron density from this lone pair. Is everyone comfortable with the concept that a alkoxy substituent should be a donor? <coughs> Who's uncomfortable with this? Who's comfortable with this? And again, we have 99% undecided. OK, we have to get this ratio up. Let me tell you that we, in the moment, have filed a application for more interactivity in uh, in, uh, in lectures, and especially in big lectures. And one of the things is that students should by, will have by their smartphone be able to an anonymously vote on these things rather than, <laughs> rather than raising the hand. Uh, but try to get a little bit engaged. It doesn't matter. It does not matter if you, if you do not, if, if you are going wrong. Let me tell you something else in just a moment. We have, also, when you have bachelor exam, which will inevitably come, uh, and so it's an oral exam, and you will, and you will have, uh, you will have to have a talk with me or one of my colleagues on organic chemistry. So typically, what will happen is, I will ask you and say, is it an alkoxy group? Is this a donor and an acceptor? Whatever you say, even if it's wrong, you say it's a donor. I say, tell me why. You say it's an acceptor, I say, tell me why. And then you start discussing. You might be on the, on, the, on, the, on the wrong track, but what you need to be able is then to come up with arguments which will support your hypothesis. And so even though you might in the end have the wrong conclusion, still we had a nice talk. We could talk about chemistry, and you get a good grade. If you're just sitting there and don't say anything, and then I, I don't know really then how to help you. And then we are looking for each other at five, for five minutes, and nothing is happening. And we have five of these questions, and then nothing has been written down. Although you might get, a, although you have said nothing wrong, but you also have said nothing right, right? And so you might get a, a lower grade than somebody who said a lot and argued convincingly, although the conclusions in the end might have been wrong, right? So. You need to get involved in this. You need to work with concepts. And we will see in a moment that I can make any argument for the alkoxy group here. And so you want to make an argument for the alkoxy group? Uh, yes, I think it's a donor because of the mesomeric effects. Very good. So new concept is, is, is introduced, mesomeric effect. The so-called M effect. And this is something you have learned in the basic organic lecture, probably when you talked about aromatic compounds. You have learned that some substituents have a so-called mesomeric effect, meaning that a lone pair of a substituent can act as a donor by delocalizing electron density into a system. So I think. What you have had in, in the organic lecture was typically that you would consider a phenol being an electron rich, electron donating substituent because this lone pair, and here we can draw resonance structures, and I can draw 
a resonance structure to show the mesomeric effect, which would look like this. And clearly, the hydroxyl group has acted as a donor here. So that's the, try to draw the analogous thing on the radical here. Try to see if you can draw a resonance structure here. And you will see you will not be able to do this. But try to convince yourself to this. If you can somehow do delocalize this to make a double bond here, you will not be able. But nevertheless, the arrangement you have here is like the typical arrangement in a double bond where you might have donation of this lone pair into this half occupied orbital. Another lone pair, yes. So, so if you draw this, I could, for example, argue that it looks like this. If I want to have a maximum overlap of an oxygen lone pair and, the, uh, and, 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 and this uh, carbon, I could argue that I put a look also at this as being sp2 hybridized. I put one lone pair in the sp2 orbital. I put the other one in the p orbital. p orbital, sp2 orbital. Something, again, you might not have seen so much in the radical context, but something which should be, you should be aware from the basic organic lecture with esters, right? Again, here, or, or let's even say, even easier, let's even say carboxylic acid or carboxylates, right? Here, again, no problems in drawing resonance structures. OK, so this is how we simply move electrons. Again, note also on the resonance structures, two electron flows in one direction. You do not have any arrows which go against you. It's always going in one direction. And now again, if you would look at this from an hybrid, from an orbital point of view, because the carbonyl group is you would consider this carbon being sp2 hybridized you would consider this oxygen being sp2 hybridized where you have two lone pairs in this case in sp2 orbitals and one lone pair in a p orbital in order to be able to do the overlap here. And then at the same point, the ester oxygen here, same thing. You would say that this is not sp3 hybridized. You would say this is sp2 hybridized in order to have the overlap here. And then out of necessity, if this is sp3 hybridized, you still have one lone pair, which has to be an sp2 orbital. So this is again sp2. This is again sp3. And so here it was very easy, because you can draw the familiar resonance structures. Here with the radicals, you cannot. Tr again, try to do this. Try to see if you can draw a resonance structure, if you try to, to make a double bond here, you exceed the electron octet on the carbon. So you should come to the conclusion that this is not possible. But nevertheless, it's by the same analogy that you have a donor which can delocalize electron density into a 
on unoccupied, or in this case into a half-occupied orbital, will convince you that indeed that by the mesomeric effect, the uh, oxygen can, be, can act as a donor. Now, if you would have answered and say, oh, a methoxy group is a electron withdrawing group, which effect would you have drawn? Which effect would you have utilized then? If you say it's not a donor, it's an acceptor. Yeah? The inductive effect. OK, very good. So you see, we are having two different concepts here. We have mesomeric effect. And we have inductive effects. And the in inductive effect simply draws on the fact that you have two bonds, uh, two atoms connected by a bond from two, ele from two elements which have different electronegativity. And so, Sometimes in books you find that to depict this, that the bonds are drawn in this way, where you have a thicker end on the more electron, uh, electronegative uh, atom. So you have here more electronegative. And so therefore, you have an inductive effect that the, the more electronegative element is pulling the electrons to each other, uh, to, the, to, it, uh, to, to the element. And the more electron positive uh, element is basically releasing this. So very often, you find also the delta minus and delta plus depiction here to show this. And so indeed, what you have very often in organic chemistry is that you have multiple effects. And these effects <coughs> might work against each other. And then very often it comes to the question, which one is more overwhelming? And for an alkoxy substituent or a hydroxy group, the M effect is stronger. The, the plus M effect, making this a donor, is stronger than the inductive effect. With the chlorine, again, if you remember this from your organic organic lecture, so this a phenol is an electron-rich arene. Chlorobenzene is an electron deficient or an electron poor arene. Although, same thing, it has, chlorine has a plus M effect, chlorine has a minus I effect. Same thing here, OH had a plus M effect, and as well, it has a negative inductive effect. In this case, for the OH, the plus M effect is stronger than the inductive effect. For the chlorine, it's the opposite. And so, depending on the element, since we have the same effects, but the evaluation, what, is, what contributes more to the overall system can be different. And this is a very good case for this. Can we understand this, or do we have to learn that hydroxyl group, the plus M effect, is more important. Chlorine, the minus I effect, is more important. Do we have to learn this, or can we make an argument for this? Except for uh, fluorine, chlorine, 
Okay, that's again, let me just repeat this because everything you say is not being transmitted to the camera very well. The reason I'm having the microphone here is not that you hear me better, you hear me, you, you see that nothing is amplified, but the microphone is going directly into the camera. So the, uh, he said here that, what's your name? Uh, Andre. Andre, Andre said that the, there's a rule that the mesomeric effect is always overwhelming if and unless fluorine chlorine is involved. I think that's what, that was what you said. Halogens in general are involved. Again, it's an interesting rule. It's again, it's a rule I would have to remember. It would not be a rule I would understand. Do you understand this rule? No. Probably not. So, so it's a rule. Rules are good, but it would be a, a rule to remember. It would not, it's not something to understand. What you're saying is, in a way, is, uh, is true. But let's see if we can find a more convincing argument. And one of the things he said is, the, or one, one, one thing we see here is that the plus M effect of chlorine is not as good as the plus M effect of hydroxy. Let's think about this. Where's the difference between chlorine and oxygen? No periodic table here. Very bad. But what's the difference? Okay. okay, let's see what, what the argument is. The argument was said that chlorine is more right. So here we have, uh, so chlorine is here seventh row, sixth row. And oxygen is in the sixth row. You said it's closer to the octet. Let's think about this for a moment. The oxygen, of course, gets, has a, another substituent partner. So let's, let's analyze this from the octet rule. The oxygen here in phenol, the oxygen has an octet, right? Everybody agrees on this? So we have second electron and lone pair here, two, four, six, eight. So that has an octet. Chlorine has an octet. So I would not see, although you're right, the chlorine itself, if I you see, your argument is you said chlorine is closer to the octet. So in a way, you are, of course, right. If you look at chlorine, and then if you look at the naked oxygen atom, then indeed, oxygen needs two electrons to fill it. Chlorine needs one electron to fill it. But in this case, we are comparing the molecules here, and the oxygen has an additional binding partner. So both have an octet. So that is apparently, at least I would not see a convincing evidence why then the plus M effect, and actually the plus M effect is even taking away electron, then, uh, electrons from that atom, why this should be better for oxygen than it should be for chlorine. Let's see if we find another argument. I guess chlorine is more electronegative, so it won't give its um, uh, electrons Okay, chlorine, it's, it is being said it's more electronegative than oxygen, so it doesn't want to donate electrons. Is that true? Anyone has electronegativity in, in its head somehow? Yeah, I think uh, chlorine 3.0 and oxygen 3.5. Yeah, there are many electronegativity scales. And again, I never really learn, um, I never really learn uh, so closely electronegativity uh, numbers out there, but the point is you have in the periodic table uh, something here on the on the right, which is then probably the, which is your your um, or, or basically fluorine let 's put the fluorine in here, fluorine being the most electronegative element, and then basically, I do this very simple Sim organic chemists are very simple minded okay. So the, the, I never learn numbers on this, but my simple rule is everything which has, the further away you go from fluorine, the more electropositive you become. And I, my argument here would be very simple. Chlorine has the same distance to fluorine like oxygen has. And so 
it's very close together. And there are 3.0, 3.5, but I, I know scales where it's both 3.4 or whatever. I will argue that it is the same. Huh? Not, 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 not there, uh, okay, let, let's, we are, we are running too many ideas here. One of the ideas is here that maybe the, uh, the, the hydrogen can provide, can provide electrons here as a donor. Would be, would be something to consider, but if you look at this, is then chlorine even has already one of its electron pairs to itself, and I would not really see why how the hydrogen has no, no additional electron density. This is everything hydrogen has in electrons. I would not see how this, this comes from. Let me just wait for a moment. Let me just stay on this concept here. So it was a good idea that somebody said the electron negativity, it wants to hold the electrons closer to each other, to, to it. What effect are we discussing if you talk about this, how you phrased it, holding the electrons closer to, to, to the atom. Is it mesomeric effect or is it inductive effect? It's again the inductive effect, right? Because the inductive effect tells you how strong, how strong this is, uh, uh, this is being um, hold to each other. And indeed, chlorine has a strong inductive effect and fluorine even more. And this is, we will see in a moment, what I consider the right argument why oxygen has a better plus M effect than chlorine, but we will see in a moment why fluorine indeed is also having, uh, although it has in a way an as good M effect as oxygen has, why again the fluorine is an electron withdrawing substituent, simply again because the inductive effect based on its electron negativity is so strong. Now we have already written this in here. What else is a difference other than the atoms are named differently, what is a difference in if you look at the periodic table in uh, between oxygen and chlorine? Maybe the size. The size. Why is the size different? Well, because uh, chlorine is in the second row. Third row. Third row. Let's not forget Mr. Hydrogen up here, right? <laughs> so this is second row. This is third row, and you already said the word size. So which one is bigger? The one in the third row, right? The more you go down, the more you, the bigger the electrons are. So the plus M effect exhibited from the chlorine lone pairs, in which orbital are they? <coughs> what orbital is this? are these lone, lone pairs here? Uh, but which row? This is in a 3p orbital, right? That's third row. This oxygen here is in a 2p. And so if I depict this, So if I have the situation where I would like to have a, let's go back to the aromatic compounds here. If I'm in the situation that I have my group here, then the mesomeric effect here is a 2p orbital is donating into the 2p orbital of the carbon. Same row, so approximately same size. 
if I have chlorine here, then the situation So not only the chlorine is bigger, but also the electrons are bigger. The, ele the, the orbitals are bigger. So probably this is its situation, right? So we have 3p, 2p here. And so simply the overlap, because the sizes are identical here, it's probably much, much better than the orbital situation here. And so this is indeed the reason. So the electronegativity, simply the question, the inductive effect, who is pulling electrons based on, on because the atoms want to have, have a certain electronegativity, a certain affinity of the electrons. This here is probably very similar. But the overlap, the mesomeric effect, which you have from the lone pairs is very different here. And that is something which you also should keep in mind that all these mesomeric structures, all the mesomeric rules are especially applicable for the second row elements and already mesomeric effects in the third row become much, much less. So, so, so all these atoms, chlorine, sulfur, phosphorus, Mesomeric stabilization is a lot lower than in the for the corresponding nitrogen, oxygen, or also even fluorine uh, compounds. Right. So let's see just again what you should re review. We talked a little bit about donor acceptor effects. And then again, we had the concept of mesomeric effects, the M effect, and inductive effects. And so make you somehow a glossary or a different page or so where you should, where you should um, write down certain concepts, you should be familiar with this. So if anyone asks you, can you explain the mesomeric effect, can you do this? Can you give an example? Can you explain the inductive effect? Do I know what donor acceptors are? Right? <laughs> Something like, like this is, uh, is very crucial here. Now we got a little bit off here. We were talking about radicals, actually. And we went back because we were more familiar with the concept two compounds where we had two electrons. But let me just go back. I put this example up for a reason. Let me just put up a molecule you know very well. This is a solvent, diethyl ether. And diethyl ether, you always have to be careful with, especially if it stands for quite a while in the sunlight or in, in, and, and is exposed to oxygen, that very easily And here we are now entering a first reaction that oxygen is very easily is capable of abstracting a hydrogen here. And again, let's be careful in, in naming here. Somebody earlier said that the radical can react with a proton. So always keep in mind that what we are abstracting here is an H dot, and so we call this as basically a hydrogen atom. And this is not to be mixed up with 
with a proton. And this is also not to be mixed up with a hydride, right? This is the, the three different species you have here. And we will see that in general, if you have a, so in this case, it's not a proton which is being abstracted. It is really a hydrogen atom which is being abstracted. And if I would have to draw you now this in mechanism terms, what I could do here is I have the oxygen diuretical. And now what I would do is I would say that this radical is attacking the hydrogen here. We have a homolytic cleavage. So half of an arrow goes here, and then half of an arrow goes here. And so these radicals, indeed with ethers, are forming quite readily. And as a consequence, then with the second molecule of, of oxygen, This can react here. And these type of let me bring this. <coughs> to an end here. Ah. Let me give this a little bit. And so with another molecule of an ether molecule, you can again now abstract the hydrogen here. Form such a peroxide. And such peroxides are extremely explosive. And so this is why diethyl ether, although in the lab we use this a lot in as a solvent in chemistry, in organic chemistry, they have the danger that this type of radical process is taking place and that explosive peroxides are being formed. And they are especially explosive if they start up building in concentration. So if you have old ether bottles where the ether is evaporating, but these have a much higher boiling point, then they start concentrating. And the explosions can be massive, absolutely massive. So you have to be extremely careful if you, if you work with Indeed, with diethyl ether, you see an old bottle. Also, there are certain ways you learn in the lab how to test for peroxides. And if in doubt, you have to discard, you have to destroy the peroxides and, uh, and basically discard of this. Now, here we have already worked through a first mechanism. And what you could see is that I, temptate, uh, tem uh, that I resisted the temptation. I took with one oxygen, I took the radical off here. And I formed here, in the meantime, this type of species. And in order to come to this compound here, I could have immediately somehow combined this radical and this radical to make this. And I resisted this temptation. And again, this is something you have to keep in mind, is that these radicals, nevertheless, occur in low concentrations. And so here also we have a low concentration. 
species and in radical chemistry the low concentration species usually do not find each other very easily so if you have a low concentration species of this and then high concentration of the oxygen, then it's much more likely that these two species will combine and not two of the low concentrations. And this will lead, when we, when we start to discuss reactions, this will lead into the fact that radical reactions follow the chain mechanism, where you will always have typically a let me see this I gave a Let's say we have a reaction where we cleave a bond halogens, can be cleaved photochemically to the corresponding radicals. It's then relatively unlikely that these species find each other in order to combine with itself, it's more likely, let's say, we're doing a photochemical bromination of ethane. It's simply much more likely that the low concentration species is then reacting with the high concentration species. Generating a new radical, and then again that this radical Now again, the temptation would be there that you say these simply combine with each other. But again, low concentration, low concentration. So typically you always see a radical as a low concentration, highly reactive intermediate, reacting with a uh, stable, uh, neutral entity. to generate the compound and then a new radical. This is the so-called chain mechanism. You have seen this. You will see this much more when we talk about reactions uh, in a little while on, on radicals. But just because I walked through here, I just want to make you aware that you will rarely see radicals recombining. So the back reaction of these two bromine radicals to a bromine molecule is very rare. You always see simply by statistics, because if you do this reaction in a pot full, full of your alkane, you simply see that your radical will react with the compound component, which is available in excess. But still, we have not been completely done on the stabilization. So as a, as, the, as a stabilization or as electronic effects, so far, we had mesomeric effect.
we have the inductive effect. And the question is, is there something more? And let's consider, again, the case where we go from a mathematical to this theoretical So secondary radical to a tertiary radical. So anyone remember which one is more which one is most stable? The right one. The tertiary is more stable. then the secondary one, secondary is more stable than the primary, and the primary is more stable than the method radical. And why is this? Huh? Through inductive effects. It's a very good answer he gave. He says there is an inductive effect, a plus inductive effect. So the methyl groups here act as a donor. They have a, they have a donating and a plus inductive effect. And this is what it stabilizes them. It's, a, it's an answer you, you read very often in textbooks. It's an answer I would not understand. It's a, it's, it's, it's a right because it explains the effect, right? We have analyzed, we have said a radical is, desta is stabilized by donors. And if we find here the experimental, experimental fact that the more methyl groups we put on here, the more stable my radical becomes, I must conclude that a methyl group is acting like a donor. And so therefore, since we do not see any mesomeric effects here, because there are no lone pairs or so which can, can stabilize the radical, it was always said it's the inductive effect. Now we analyzed before that the inductive effect is based on electronegativity differences. Is there an electronegativity difference between carbon and carbon? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's a there, there so there's a the argument is being made, which says this is sp3, this is sp2. So there's a difference in hybridization. And therefore, this could explain the donor effect. Very interesting argument. I must say, I've never heard about this. And we are going into this now. So which one is more electronegative of the two? SP2 or SP3? The SP2, the SP2 is more ele electronegative. So negative, and the argument for this is higher S character. And S is always, the S orbitals are closer to the, to the nucleus, and so therefore, it, because the S character is higher, the electrons are closer to the nucleus, and therefore, basically, they are more pulled to this atom. So this is a good argument. This is interesting. So this is more electronegative than this. But this is anyhow electron deficient, right? Because not only because of that, not only because of that uh, hybridization argument, this simply has an electron, <laughs> it's an electron away from happiness. This has seven electrons. This has not a 
uh, that this has not an octet. So no matter if this is differently hybridized or not, I would st always argue that this is the more electron, the more electron deficient carbon here, simply because it's away from the uh, from the electron uh, octet. And I would still not understand why a methyl group should act, should be able to donate electrons. Why should this be able, able to donate electrons? Why not a simple hydrogen? Hydrogen is actually in the electronegativity also similar to, to carbon, right? So basically, and let's not, this is a good argument. It's interesting and it's a good, it's again a good concept that you should recognize that the higher the S character in orbitals is, the closer the electrons are being pulled to the nucleus, the more electronegative basically is a, is, is, is a carbon. But simply on an, on, an, on, on an inductive argument, I would still argue that carbon-carbon has the same electronegativity. I would not really understand too well why this should be a better donor than, let's say, hydrogen or so. Yeah, this is the concept here we see. So somebody says, it's a, sorry that I cut you off, but you are not being heard. It's only I'm being heard here. So it's the hyperconjugation. It's, a new, it's, a, it's, an, it's another concept which is being introduced here, which will be the last thing we do for today. You see, I do not believe in breaks, but on the other hand, I believe then if I take a break, you, your break away, I believe in finishing in time so that you have actually half an hour uh, to the next lecture. So the hyperconjugation, what kind of effect is this now? <coughs> this is an effect where we say that we have a radical and then who's hyperconjugating? Who is the where do we see now the donating effect? What is the hyperconjugation of which bond? The carbon-hydrogen bond. This sigma bond here can in principle also, if it is oriented right, and you know you can rotate around this bond, if it is oriented right, it can also donate electrons into this empty or in the, if, you, if you stay with the radical into this half occupied orbital. So there is some kind of a donation. This is the hyperconjugation. Of this sigma bond here, of the electron density of the sigma bond here, into this empty orbital. This might not be very good, but it's better than nothing, right? It's better than if this is not there. If you just have hydrogens. Why isn't it working with the hydrogens? Well, we have also electron pairs here, right? The hydrogens cannot line up in the right orbital geometry in order to interact with each other. With the, uh, the moment you have methyl groups in here, you can always orient one of the carbon-hydrogen bonds here in a way that it is uh, lining up properly that you can do, uh, that you can do uh, some kind of a, a what is called hyperconjugation. Nevertheless, if you want to, I can draw even a resonance structure here. Because resonance structures, mesomeric structures, simply say you move electrons. So let's move it here. Let's go to the extreme. If you look at this, if I break this bond and donate it completely to the carbon to make a new double bond, and then I would have some kind of a H dot here, right? So if I, what I have basically done here is now I have delocate, de delocalized one of the electrons of this carbon-hydrogen bond completely to the, to the carbon. 
This is a drawing we don't like so much because organic chemists don't like hanging around atoms, right? You think this is actually now starting to attack and we have an alkene and something is being missing here or so. But this is a valid resonance structure. It might not contribute a lot to, to the overall structure because we are basically in the extreme having broken a bond here. But nevertheless, we did what we are allowed to do when we're drawing mesomeric structure. I moved one of the electrons over here forming the new double bond. And in this course, I simply had to break the bond here. And again, it might, uh, might be a low contribution. But this is better than no contribution. from the CH bonds. And again, if you go to the, to the really mesomeric structure, if you look at this for as the last thing here, if I would have discussed with you the allyl radical, where I would have now the pi bond here. Let me draw this just in the formula way. So here, of course, you see hopefully the analogy. If I have an L radical, I could draw a resonance structure like this. And so therefore, basically again, I have done the very same thing, only that in mesomeric structures, we usually move pi bonds. And this is something you know very well. Here in this hyperconjugation, we have involved into a mesomeric structure a sigma bond. And this, is, this here is we would call conjugation. Conjugation of the, the radical center is conjugated to a pi bond. Here we have a hyperconjugation that the radical center is basically in some kind of hyperconjugation to the, to the CH bond. So what you should see here is that these two concepts are related with each other. The mesomeric uh, concept involves pi electron. Hyperconjugation involves sigma electrons. So it's really conjugation just with sigma bonds, which have to be oriented in the right way. Again, keep in mind here, we have a lot of sigma bonds here, but they cannot orient in the proper way to, over, to interact with the p orbital. And so again, these two things is basically its, mesom its mesomeric effect, the one with pi electrons, the other with sigma electrons. So you have seen we have been relatively slow here on this, but we have covered a lot of concepts. These are concepts we will see over and over and over again. So please uh, try to get this in hand. And, um, and so we, we will continue on this next week. We have one question here. Is there any book I would recommend? Um, yes. The, okay, let's do, let's do the book question next time. I, I, t I give you the, this in a, in a moment, but let's, everyone is leaving here. Let's do it next time. Okay, so see you on Friday then. Bitte?